The following program contains scenes of sexuality, violence, coarse language, and adult themes. Because it's awesome. Viewer discretion is advised. Should a game where the main character is dressed mostly like this be treated as sexist because of just one scene where she's dressed like this? Uh, it's kind of cold in here. Roll the intro. Where's the line between a sexist moment and a completely sexist game? I'm Leanna Kersner, and this is the cosmic entity you have named Glowy Box. <laughs> to this point, the discussion of sexism in video games has been a discussion of moments. Clip reels of horrible scene after horrible scene of violence and degradation of women in rapid succession. This has led to a mainstream stigma that gamers in general are sexist. But gamers say that we don't believe these moments accurately reflect the overall context of the games they come from. So, can we determine the point, or a series of potential points, where there are enough sexist moments in a game to determine that the entire game is sexist? The first thing we have to do is decide what sexism itself means, and that's this week's Lady Bit. The dictionary definition of sexism sucks. Sexism is defined as prejudice, stereotyping, or discrimination, typically against women on the basis of sex. This is a useless definition because it's so vague that we can't apply and test it. How do we quantify prejudice, discrimination? What does on the basis of sex mean? For something to be bad, we need to demonstrate a negative impact. What we have now is an I know it when I see it process. This leads to a lot of confusion and hurt feelings. Fortunately, social science has been working on this problem by defining two types of sexism that work together based on their impacts. These categories are hostile sexism and benevolent sexism. Hostile sexism is an antagonistic attitude towards women and it's the easier type to identify. It's a negative perception of women often depicting women as incompetent, unintelligent, overly emotional, and manipulative. We understand that this sort of sexism is harmful because it grants men moral license to dominate, abuse, and control women. Benevolent sexism is harder to understand because at first it seems positive, perhaps even noble, hence the use of the word benevolent. But it's potentially even more insidious because it provides reasons for gender discrimination that actually sound helpful. For instance, women should stay at home with the kids because they're better at it than men. Sounds so much better than women shouldn't work because they're just not capable. But both perspectives provide excuses for excluding women from the workforce. And women are just as likely as men to promote these views when they're framed in a benevolent way. The core of benevolent sexism is the idealization of women as wives and mothers to the detriment of all other roles. Benevolent sexism creates a list of ideal qualities tied to these domestic roles, hinging on modesty, chastity, and caregiving. People have a very hard time seeing their mothers, daughters, and sisters as beings with any sort of sex drive, so they aren't seeing these women as whole people. You exist because your mom had sex. So why is it so hard to admit to yourself that your mom has a sex life? For a lot of people though, this is really uncomfortable. Now, this is not the same as being sexually attracted to your mother. I can't believe I have to say that, but we're so culturally twisted about sex that I do. Ugh. Benevolent sexism complicates the idea that something can only be sexist if there's a conscious intent to demean women, because benevolent sexism is done by people who actually think they're doing something good. If women are secretly happy or staying at home with kids, it's benevolent to discourage them from working. If women are at greater risk of harm, it's benevolent to discourage them from going into dangerous jobs. If women are just too stressed out being leaders of companies and countries, my god, it's cruel to put them in these roles. It's benevolent to save them from these things. In the minds of people with these views, they're helping. 
Now, this doesn't mean that some women don't prefer to be stay-at-home moms, but some men prefer childcare to more aggressive social roles as well. The critical difference is that women who defy benevolently sexist norms are treated like whores and get told they had it coming if they're assaulted. That's why you hear certain academic types say you can't be sexist against men. The truth is that you can be sexist against men. There just aren't extra social restrictions for men in the interests of rape avoidance. The other side of the unique sexual assault threat against women is that benevolent sexism encourages men to put women up on artificial moral pedestals instead of treating women like equals. Yeah, putting women up on pedestals because we're women is a bad thing. To be clear, this isn't about being nice to people in general. It's not about the very noble goal of wanting to protect your loved ones. It's about the idea that you have to be extra protective of women because we're somehow weaker. As a society, we're still not good at recognizing that if it's wrong to do something to a woman, then it's probably wrong to do it to anyone. A butt ton of benevolent sexism. And before you ask, I have no idea how big a butt ton is. It varies with the butt. Anyway, a lot of benevolent sexism has crept into the analysis of video games through the allegedly feminist promotion of modestly dressed female characters. Now, this doesn't mean that there isn't a time and a place for modesty, or that women who prefer to dress modestly are somehow bad for all women. It just means that hashtag feminism has somehow in gaming been equated with the benevolently sexist idea that modestly dressed female characters are better role models for adult women than women with a more sexual image. Again, women are people, and sexuality is part of the human condition. So, penalizing female characters for sexy outfits isn't equality in an industry where male characters dress like this with no complaints. If we keep collectively sending this message that covering up is what a good woman does, then it also sends the message that if you want to go out and flaunt your body, you're somehow doing something dirty. Men don't have to worry about this crap. Because most people labor under some degree of benevolent sexism, and I know it when I see it approach to sexism just doesn't work. Because of this, I'd like to offer a more specific, measurable definition of the term. Ideas or behaviors that perpetuate the dominance of one gender over other genders. This definition provides a practical reason that sexism is a problem, rather than relying on some sort of assumptive moral argument based on social norms. If a woman has to be modest, men are dominant in sexual encounters. If a woman has to stay at home with the kids, men are financially dominant. So now that we have our more specific definition, let's test it on a well-known video game scenario, Mario's ongoing efforts to rescue Princess Peach. The current assumption is that Peach is a straight-up damsel in distress character and therefore Nintendo perpetuates regressive myths about women. Easy. Sexism. Now, I'll look at that damsel in distress literary construct more deeply in a future show, but for now, let's take a different look at Princess Peach that emphasizes her role in the Mushroom Kingdom instead of her gender. Princess Peach is the ruler of the Mushroom Kingdom. Mario is Peach's protector. Bowser is the ruler of a neighboring kingdom. Now, Bowser repeatedly kidnaps Peach to try to take over the Mushroom Kingdom. So, does Nintendo's favorite game plot structure perpetuate the dominance of men over women? Well, to determine this, we have to ask, would Mario games change significantly if Peach were male? Well, no. If Peach were male, Bowser would still have to depose that male ruler to take over the Mushroom Kingdom. In fact, various Mario Universe games have used the exact same structure to have Luigi rescue Mario, Toad and Toadette rescue each other, and even Peach rescuing Mario and Luigi. Luigi's Mansion, Captain Toad's Treasure Tracker, and Super Princess Peach use the exact same main plot structure as the stories where Mario rescues Peach. So, as much as people want to complain about Peach's emotion powers in Super Princess Peach, it's not as if Nintendo treats male characters as dominant over female characters, even though the character designs adhere to pretty traditional gender signifiers. Some of you may be thinking, so why do we compare Peach to the random woman tied to the railroad tracks instead of the numerous fictional presidents in TV shows, films, and video games who are held hostage or kidnapped for the hero to save? I'll just let that question hang there until the damsel in distress episode. Talk amongst yourselves. Remember, this show is about asking questions and starting discussions. 
For now, it's enough to answer the question, does Mario rescuing Peach from Bowser perpetuate dominance of men over women? As saying that, no, Peach is a head of state and not just a damsel in distress. So, it's 2017. Men can give other men kisses on the cheek, especially in Europe. So, now that we have a measurable definition of sexism, we can debate where the line is between a game that has sexist moments and a game that is entirely sexist. Of course, debate means it's time for Lady Bits versus Mode. Let's face it, when it was okay to have chainmail bikini girls and sexy ninjas all over the place, that's all we got. That's a sign that things weren't just innocent fun. Women weren't being valued for our brains. We were given trophy status and no one terribly cared what we thought about it. That's because game developers were trying to mimic the sexuality of swimsuit editions, music videos, and NASCAR, not what they like themselves. If people who make games were more honest, there'd be a lot more furries, gay dudes, and big beautiful women in games. Because I know a lot of people who make games who are into that stuff. But the minute they try to actually express that, mockery. That's not an excuse though. Feeling the need to actively and artificially titillate male players to the detriment of the quality of the female characters is in itself a sexist attitude. It's pandering to sexism and claiming it's necessary, even though gaming became popular in the Nintendo era as a product that primarily appealed to kids. All this overtly sexual content is just lazy design, and it's sometimes so distorted that it isn't even all that sexy. Sexy isn't sexist, though. That line gets crossed when all the sexy is for the guys and there's nothing for women, especially when it's that overtly stupid, demeaning, uncomfortable form of sexy, and that happens a lot in games. Yeah, that's happened a lot, but we have to be careful to distinguish between products made for men and products that are harmful to women. Those two things get confused a lot though, because of sexist boys will be boys attitudes. No, not all guys enjoy treating women like meat, and way too many games deliberately appeal to the meatheads. Because publishers won't question those decisions, but Okay, sexism by publishers is still sexism, but it doesn't mean the chainmail bikini girls and sexy ninjas are inherently sexist on their own. The overuse of them and the lack of overall diversity of female characters is the problem. Fighting games get a bad rap for sexist game designs, but they're actually more inclusive than other types of games. Fighting games were some of the first games to realize that players actually wanted to play as female characters. Some of those costumes though. Hey, Ivy Valentine in Soul Calibur is no more naked than Baldo, so if we don't complain about half-naked male characters, it's sexist to hold women to stricter standards. The size of her boobs is ridiculous though. Whoa, 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 we're not in a position to criticize anybody for having giant boobs. Is this gonna go on much longer, by the way? My neck is killing me in this getup. Proof positive, those costumes aren't practical. Yeah, that's why they're fun. Fun for whom? What exactly does that armor protect against? Being ignored. Come on, it's fantasy. It's permission to be ridiculous. No one expects these things to be real in everyday life. And there's lots of different kinds of sexy. The stuff that men go through to get Thor-like muscles is just a different kind of unpleasant than the stuff women do to ourselves. Some bodybuilders can't even wipe their own butts. I'm almost afraid to ask, who wipes their butts? Their wives. And women, once again, end up on the ass end of things. Yeah, that was kind of a derail. It's still cold in here. Can we move it along? Okay. Name three sexist games that aren't Grand Theft Auto. No way. That's a great way to get everyone mad at me. So you're bullied into not speaking your mind? I prefer to think of it as picking my battles. You don't think it's an indicator of a problem that you're not allowed to voice your opinions? Fine. You want three sexist games? Duke Nukem Forever, Metroid Other M, and Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts? I love Kingdom Hearts. OMG, what is wrong with you? How can you hate on Kingdom Hearts? Because Kairi is the only original character who's a girl, and she's the only one that doesn't fight. That's really rigid gender roles. You just don't know what you're talking about. You clearly have internalized misogyny. Safe space, safe space. See, this is why I, need a safe I didn't space. want a name. Where's my coloring book? And this is why we can't have nice things when someone condemns an entire game as sexist as opposed to pointing out sexist moments. Emotions run high, people get defensive, things get nasty, and the conversation stops. Despite this <laughs> challenge, the LadyBits community did offer some suggestions for the line between a sexist moment and a sexist game. The consensus was that a game is sexist if it doesn't just show sexism, but condones it as normal, natural, or even 
funny. Some examples. Sexism by heroes, not just villains. Making a character a sex object first and a character second. And when games penalize only female characters in character statistics. There were really deep, amazing discussions about whether games like Bayonetta and Lollipop Chainsaw were sexist games, but I want to save those games for later shows. I also want to save Grand Theft Auto for the next episode of this series. Grand Theft Auto just seemed like such an anomaly in gaming that dissecting it in this context, it felt like a cheap shot. So I want to look at another morally ambiguous game franchise that, in my opinion, evolved from sexist games to games that just have sexist moments. The Witcher series. Okay, you're freaking out. I'll wait. I'll give you a moment. Safe space, safe space. One person the courage to face the calm? No, you're not calm. Okay, hit pause if you're still freaking out. I'm moving on. The Witcher series has been much maligned, including by me, for its treatment of female characters. But there have been notable improvements from game to game that are instructive to look at. The source material for the original 2007 Witcher game is a beloved Polish fantasy series of short stories and novels that have been adapted into a TV show as well as the games. The books were initially published in the 1990s, immediately after Poland had thrown off Soviet control and had embraced more democratic government. The Witcher isn't just an apolitical series, it's deliberately anti-political. It's a harsh, brutal fictional world and the men of the lower classes attempt to reclaim their fractured masculinity through hard drinking, boastful boorishness, and potty mouths. At least I'll die holding a lovely ass. Absolute power is concentrated in the hands of a few and wars are fought over family squabbles that don't change life for commoners in the slightest. Women are only protected from rape, and there's so much rape, if a powerful man wills it, but some of those powerful men do plenty of rape on themselves. The historical allegory runs pretty thick. That's important to know, because the ideal Soviet communist worker was stocky and overall clad no matter what gender they were, so Eastern European women's liberation includes an element of hyper-femininity that North American feminists don't quite understand. So, because of that, I'm going to avoid looking too much at the female character designs. But there was a gameplay feature of the first Witcher game that faced a lot of backlash because of the way it used sexy ladies. The 2007 game contained a set of collectible cards called romance cards, more accurately nicknamed sex cards, because in some cases, series hero Geralt of Rivia doesn't even learn the women's names. As you'd expect by the name sex cards, the cards are collected by having sex with around two dozen different women. In case you're wondering, yes, witchers are immune to STDs. Meanwhile, one of the game's favorite insults is whore. The male equivalent insult is whore son. Witcher's mistress, they call me, Kingslayer's whore. So we have a game that shames women for sexual activity, but encourages the protagonist to play penis Pokemon. Is penis Pokemon the right joke there? I think man parts the gathering sounds better, because, you know, the whole object is to tap that? Anyway, the in-game justification for all this sex is that women use witchers for casual sex because witchers are sterile and disease resistant. But that would make Geralt the whore, not the women. And men in the witcher don't get called whores. Prostituting your male protagonist for collectibles while insulting women for similar behavior allows men to be sexually dominant. And rape is used as a weapon of war in the witcher because sexual purity matters for women and not for men. Yeah, I know, the appeal of the Witcher games is that morality isn't black and white. At some point, you're gonna have to do something that doesn't sit well with you. But the way the first game presented some of those decisions was more than a little clunky. For example, you never have the option to sleep with a woman who's plus size. The only clear morality is the beauty myth. The game assumed that no dude would want to sleep with a fat chick, and oh good lord, if you think that, you do not know the diversity of male sexual appetites. Developer CD Projekt Red wisely removed the sex cards for the next game, The Witcher 2 Assassin of Kings. The Witcher 2 also reintroduced many more interesting female characters, ones with actual names, but they're demeaned, abused, maimed, and dominated by various men throughout the game. That time of the month. Again, sexist actions by characters in a game do not make the entire game sexist, but once again, The Witcher 2 involves sexism in the gameplay. Many elements of the game still perpetuate the assumption that men are dominant over women by artificially limiting player choice. Here's an example. One potential romance option is a woman named Beth, the only woman in the elite Blue Stripe Special Forces unit. 
the game makes it clear that she's a skilled warrior, the best sharpshooter in her unit, and she is very interested in being treated no differently from her male counterparts, despite choosing a distinctly different uniform. Vess is a potential sex partner for Geralt, but only if he takes her seriously as a fighter and doesn't go easy on her in a combat tournament. Later, Vess gets coerced into sex by one of the kings while she's trying to protect her fellow soldiers. Her unit gets slaughtered by that king anyway, save her commander, professional turd burglar Vernon Roach. This triggers a revenge plot that Geralt partakes in with Roach. Because the men don't want Vess to get hurt again. Vernon Roach spends the entire prologue of the game torturing Geralt, and he didn't give a damn if Geralt got hurt again. During that time, he was also getting Vess to make him a sandwich. Yep, that actually happened. Vess! Bring us food and drink. The more purely logical choice would be for Geralt to take Vess with him for revenge against King Hensel. She's the better fighter, and she was the one who was directly wrong. But that isn't an option. Despite the game creating other temporary playable characters at points that don't make a lot of sense. If they had to limit animated characters, fine, but that didn't seem to be a concern. They just didn't make Vess the potential battle companion, seemingly because of the assumption that a victim of sexual assault can't fight for herself. To be absolutely clear, the problem is not protecting someone incapable of protecting themselves. The problem is that Vess is completely capable of fighting her own fight, and the game sticks Geralt with a guy who wears a hat made from a cry towel. Son of a whore! CD Projekt Red finally got it much more right with the 2015 release of The Witcher 3 The Wild Hunt. Now, okay, this is only about how the game became less sexist. It's not commenting on alleged employee abuses and the legendary crunch period during the making of the game. Abusing your staff is never cool. Vernon Roach abuses his staff. Don't be like Vernon Roach. Nobody likes Vernon Roach. I hate Vernon Roach, but not as much as I hate The Sims. I hate The Sims. In The Witcher 3, the Northern Kingdoms are still a pretty horrible place for pretty much everyone who lives in them, but female characters in The Witcher 3 are finally given more equal standing by the game itself. First, there's Ciri, a female Witcher and a sort of adopted daughter of Geralt, who debuts as a secondary playable character. Unlike previous cool women in The Witcher games, Ciri isn't doomed to horrible abuses forced on her by the game. Triss Marigold, meanwhile, doesn't spend the entire game being called The Witcher's Whore, like she did in The Witcher 2. And she finally stands up for her damn self if Geralt sleeps with every other woman in the game. Sorceress Philippa Eilhart is portrayed as an awesome badass instead of a stereotypical evil lesbian. And Yennefer of Vengerberg finally gets to be a character instead of a plot device. And what a character. She's one of the most complex, challenging, well-defined women in any video game ever made. Yennefer has a bold, aggressive personality and makes decisions that will challenge the player's assumptions of what female characters are supposed to do. Yennefer is the most sexually aggressive woman in the game, right down to a now infamous unicorn sex scene, but her wardrobe is anachronistically conservative. Yen has sex because she wants to have sex, not to manipulate men or seek their approval. She encourages all of Geralt's worst tendencies though, so I loved her as a character without seeing her as an ideal love interest. Essentially, Yennefer single-handedly murders benevolent sexism. And Vess! Vess isn't handled much better, but this is where we make the distinction between a game that makes a few mistakes here and there and a game that overall perpetuates the dominance of men over women. The world of The Witcher hasn't changed. It's still a violent, misogynist, horrible place. But the way the game handles the characters is decidedly different from the first two games. So while the world is sexist and many of the characters are sexist, the game itself is not. The game assumes female characters are just as capable of feats of heroism and evil as men. CD Projekt Red, learn to do better with each game, and we should reward developers that show such obvious improvements. The Witcher 3 shows that developers don't have to remove all the sex and nudity or morally challenging plots from games to avoid assuming male dominance. Now, some of you might be pissed at me for saying The Witcher and The Witcher 2 are sexist, because you like The Witcher or The Witcher 2. But to me, saying The Witcher 2 is sexist is the same as saying that the combat in Dragon Age needs massive improvement. I treat both these criticisms as game design flaws, not moral ones. The bar for determining a whole game is sexist should be set quite high, but we shouldn't be afraid to set that bar at all because no game is perfect. Sometimes game developers just make dumb choices. 
Sometimes they're pressured to make those dumb choices by their publishers. And sometimes they just chicken out and produce the same crap over and over and over again, not because they like it, but because they think the public will buy it. Game companies shouldn't be crucified for these mistakes. Dogpiling a developer doesn't help them learn. It just spooks them into not trying to be creative with female characters anymore. How much developers should care about complaints of sexism is the topic for my next show. For now, it's time for this week's trophy. Da -da -da -da. I call it Sexy Ted. On to the show. And another episode bites the dust. Thanks for watching. If you like what you see, donations are appreciated. And please share this episode on your social media feeds. I'm Leanna Kersner. Thanks for letting me show you my lady bits. You did this on purpose, didn't you? You messed up on the hair. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. You're a man without honor, Vernon Roach.